you cannot begin to even think about science unless you are already conscious, unless you have already an experience. So in some fundamental sense, consciousness and experience precedes science. It's the ground for science. And that therefore, the phenomenon of consciousness uh, touches on a level of the world or reality that is not just a cognitive function, but something that has to do with the very way in which we become to exist and to know. So in some sense, I think consciousness has the potential to do a major, the study of consciousness, the potential to do a major revolution in what science is all about. Uh, because it really uh, takes us really in a, in a more definitive way beyond the, the, um, the classical picture of the subject object, the description of a, a separated subject that actually takes away anything that has to do with their own life, or their own embodiment, to say it more precisely, and do an analysis of the world. That is, of course, the classical model of physics. The more you remove the people behind the experiment, the more this is a third-person objective. So the study of consciousness requires the development of first-person methods. And these first-person methods are a radical departure from classical science. One is disembodied, impersonal. The other one is fully embodied, totally situated, and, as they say, indexed, in other words. It points to here, now. Um, both of them can give us knowledge. In both of them, you can have good science. And the question is, how do these two actually can work together? It's not a question that one is true and the other one is false. So it is in this articulation between first person and third person, I think there is a real potential for opening up science a lot more. The colleagues that think that consciousness is just going to be another mechanism do not agree, of course. They think first person is not necessary, that with third person we will get to what consciousness really is. Well, maybe they are right, maybe they are not. I don't think they are. But um, that's, where the, that's where the debate is, uh, is today. So that's why I'm a strong uh, defender and I try to develop, like in this experiment, uh, the losing the fear, breaking the taboo about using first-person methods in good science, in good experiments. So I'm going to be kicking it old new school. It's a PowerPoint presentation with bullet points and images and little things that fly up and down. OK, so the topic today is uh, conflict in a cosmic context. And again, as I raised in the, um, in the meditation, this issue of the relative and the absolute. Um, so my interest in the relative and the absolute from the contemplative side comes from this beautiful uh, chant poem um, whose origin I don't know, but I'm sure there are people who do know. Um, and I want to just read a piece of it to you. Excuse me? Thank you. Thank you, Roshi. <laughs> All I know is I had to chant it every morning, you know? So <laughs> but there's a piece of it here, and I'll show you that it was just like blew me away, which was, um, so this is just a piece of it. Everything has its own intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position. Ordinary life fits the absolute as a box and its lid. That was it. That was the metaphor that just stuck with me. Ordinary life fits the absolute as a box and its lid. The absolute works together with the relative like two arrows meeting in midair. When you walk the way, it is not near. It is not far. If you are deluded, you are mountains and rivers away from it.
So what does this have to do with our topic? Well, because what I want to contrast here, the, the sort of absolute view, the large-scale view that astronomy, or you know, particularly astronomy, but that science attempts to give us, and the relative view of our lives and what's the conflicts in our lives, um, and play them against each other. Because uh, the absolute view, as Roshi Bill Murray once said <laughs> in the great movie um, Meatballs, anybody seen it, Meatballs, Meatballs? Awesome, right? At the end, there's, you know, there, that's, he's, uh, he's the head of a camp, and one, th their camp is going against, like, the really rich kid camp, and he's talking about this game that they've got to win, and at the end, he just stands up, and you know, after giving this great speech, and he says, we got to win because it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. He goes into this <laughs> chant for a while, it just doesn't, and that's kind of the cosmic view. It's like, it doesn't matter, you know? It's a billion worlds, you know? What does it matter? <laughs> And then comparing that to um, the, uh, this great story from Master Ichu, it's, a, it's a, from a koan, where someone asks, uh, you know, can you give me some wisdom? And he says, writes down, attention. He says, well, what does that mean? You know, uh, come on, give me some wisdom. He says, attention, attention. <laughs> and then, you know, third time, attention, 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 that everything matters. You have to be present for everything in your life, in what's appearing to you. So those are the two ideas we want to play against each other. And so here's a little table of contents. Um, first, we're going to be talking for a while about science and conflict. And we're going to be talking really about the, the metaphysics, the background, the philosophical stance science takes, which I'm going to argue has infected the world in ways that are, are you know, uh, dangerous um, and have led to sort of the mess we're in. Um, and then we'll move on to talking about science and the sacred, which I feel is the antidote to this. Then we'll talk, we're going to really work on this 10,000 foot view, to get, or 10,000 light year view, excuse me, because the last half of the talk I'll be talking about something that's very near and dear to my heart. It's the subject of my new book, um, which I call the astrobiology of the Anthropocene. It's a different way of viewing climate change and the environment, which for me, you know, really rings true, and it's really the way in which this absolute view can actually change the relative, uh, in, or at least I believe. Okay, so here's this text, this book, it's not a textbook, uh, that I just love. When I, bought, I, you know, I found it in the store and I just went crazy over it. Science and ultimate reality, right? You can't say that title without ultimate reality. You should have reverb on it, right? Um, I just thought that, you know, it's a great book, lots of great articles in it, but just, the, you know, the audacity of that title. <laughs> What are you doing? Oh, just, you know, ultimate reality, you know. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, but. So the point of physics, and the point why I went into physics, right, when I was a kid was because, you know, I wanted that deepest account of nature, the God's eye view. So what, you know, now physicists would call the basal structure, the most fundamental, the basement of the world, right? That's the dream that we physicists, uh, and other scientists too, depending on what you're studying, life, the mind, you know, are hoping for, right? And um, it's a good dream, but I think it has led in some bad directions. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about the idea of reductionism, materialism, and the objective frame. And here, what I would argue is this is basically the, the philosophical, even if it's unacknowledged, the background philosophical assumptions that science uh, works with, that it's, you know, it's just sort of there, and oftentimes if you're trying to present an alternative view, the hostility is coming about because it's, it's, it's you know, in one way or another, is pushing against some of the ideas here. So um, reductionism is basically the idea that everything we see in the world is composed of smaller parts. Um, particles, fields, some kind of structure. Um, and that there are, in fact, ultimate small parts. You know, we don't know what they are yet. They don't necessarily have to be particles. They could be fields, but they are, that's the basal, the, the basal structure that physicists are talking about. And down here I have, um, you know, this is the standard model of particle physics. So this is basically a list of all the particles that we think exist in the universe right now. So we've got quarks and we've got leptons. And, you know, they slice and dice. They come in, you know, different varieties. Um, and then there are forces between them. The, 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 the forces are also part of this. There's only four forces that we know of, electromagnetic magnetism, the uh, gravity, the strong force which holds um, nuclei together, and the weak force which I've never really understood what it's doing there. But you know, it's there, what are you going to do? No, it actually has to do with radioactivity, you know, so it's, it's elemental in its way. Um, and so uh, part of, so that's the materialism view, right? That, the, you know, there's, uh, everything's built of smallest parts, a materialist reductionist view, that everything's built of, the small, of its smallest parts. Um, and in particular, as you go up, as you build the world out of these smallest parts, nothing new happens. If you know the laws of the smallest parts, if you had God's computer, you could predict everything that's going to happen on the largest levels. So, you know, what it means is the world is nothing but, quote, Nothing but, you'll see that a lot, nothing but atoms, and in particular, the mind is nothing but neurons. Um, and these structures exist objectively, meaning that they're independent of experience. Doesn't matter whether you're looking or not, 
they're still there. So um, I teach this to my students as Eeyore, the Eeyore, you know, not the, not the sad little donkey, but the external, independent, objective reality. This is the dream that, you know, young physicists, <laughs> when I was a young man, you know, this is the dream we have. I'm going to know the external, independent, objective reality. And, you know, it's a very seductive idea, right? Um, but I'm going to argue that that is part of this, this uh, you know, I, nobody knows if that's true, you know, <laughs> does that really exist, right? But there's sort of the assumption in science, often, that that does exist, and that's what we're shooting for. And because of science's efficacy, right, the, the fact that science is so good at building weapons, you know, or generating wealth, um, that this sort of philosophical baggage went along with it and then ended up, you know, in some sense infecting the whole culture. So reductionism, what is reductionism but a dead world, right? It's, oh, it's nothing but atoms. And there's, yeah, you know, life is nothing but, you know, biological machinery. Um, and so, you know, it's inherently a dead world. And it's a dead world that's, you know, since we're always interested in quantity um, and, you know, things that can be uh, uh, numericized, um, it can also be monetized, right? So the only thing that exists in the world are things that have either who have value or don't have value. Um, and if they have value, you should go after them. And then scientism, is, as opposed to science, is this idea that, oh, this baggage, this philosophical baggage, that's all there is. Anything, there's nothing else of value, you know, anything you've learned from art, eh, okay, that's great for you, but it's not really important. I'm not kidding, that's really the way it is. People who have this view is sort of like, you know, you try and say like, well, you know, there is something that comes across in art that is, is foundational. It's like, no, it's not. That's just psychology, you know. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> Along with that um, is, you know, uh, this because, again, science has such efficacy and is so powerful, the power structure adopts it, ado and then its, and its philosophy gets adopted. So, you know, in particular, the mess we're in with corporate capitalism and the environment. And I put corporate capitalism down there because I'm not, I don't think capitalism itself necessarily is bad. It just depends on what kind of capitalism you have, you know, what it's, what it's integrated with. But the kind we have now, where corporations are people um, and, you know, the, the dominant role of, um, of advertising in our lives and the way it literally, you know, the, the uh, sophistication with which it's used to shape uh, our, our views of ourselves, our feelings, that's really the problem. And so if materialism is, is your dominant philosophy, if the world is just dead, then um, there's no way really to value, you know, the world, the world we experience, our, 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 our responses, our emotional responses to the world. And that's why actually I actually wanted to go back to here. So, uh, you know, this image of this empty parking lot with a Home Depot, which is closed, right? Identifies, you know, sometimes, you know, I have to go to the mall and I walk around and I realize that, like, you know, the, our built environment reflects this sort of dead world that, like, we're, we're so deadened that people don't even know why they feel bad. Like, they, don't, they can't even recognize, like, you know, you know, you go to a mall and you kind of feel bad after a half an hour. Um, and, but, like, we're so inured that we can't even know that we feel bad. You know, but you put somebody in the woods and they know they feel good, right? Like, oh, I feel so much better. But they can't know that this makes them feel crappy. And that's part of this dead world that, you know, the, the underpinning that we've built a dead world and built a, something that, that is basically a mess. So I now want to talk a little bit about an alternative pathway, which is to sort of think about science and sacredness and to see if there's a way in which to um, re-sacralize the process of science. Because I'm going to argue that uh, it started that way. Science, when it began, you know, was very much about a connection, was very much a spiritual pursuit. Um, but by doing this, I first want to invite you. See, see how, spirit, how, how all my uh, practices help me? I'm from Jersey. I really want to say, like, oh, quantum mechanics. Oh, God, let's not do this again. Um, but I want to invite you to reimagine the relationship between spirituality and quantum mechanics. Um, you know, I'm a veteran of the quantum interpretation wars. So, you know, like many people, you know, when uh, Tao of Physics came out, I read, I was like 18 years old, I read it. I was like, yeah, this is great, you know? But as I learned more, I recognized that actually it's completely wrong. It is completely wrong. This view of, because here's the problem with quantum. Quantum mechanics is amazing. For those of you who don't know, quantum mechanics is the theory we have of the very small, of the micro world. And it is profound and mysterious and bizarre in lots of ways. But the thing is, after 100 years uh, of allowing us to build things like computers, we don't really understand what it's telling us about the nature of the world. Um, and so what there are, there are these different interpretations of the calculus, of the machinery of quantum mechanics. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a bunch of interpretations. There's the, quant the Copenhagen interpretation, hidden variables, many worlds, the objective collapse, rationalism, quantum Bayesianism, which is one I particularly like. But the point is, nobody knows which one of these are true. Nobody knows which one is the, you know, is the right one to pin the tail on the, you know, on the quantum mechanical donkey. Um, so 
why, by saying like, oh, quantum mechanics shows us that the worldview of, uh, of Buddhism is, or contemplative practice is somehow true, is to favor one of them, which is basically the Copenhagen interpretation. But, you know, there's no reason to do that. You may like it, right? You know, I like, there's aspects of the, of the Copenhagen interpretation I like, but it may very well be, as a scientist, I gotta say, it could turn out to be the many worlds interpretation, which I hate, you know, and which has nothing to do with Buddhism. If that's the world that's true, there's, the, you know, if that's the one that's true, there's not much you're going to be able to find as a, a contemplative practitioner that will make you happy. So I, I, I'm, this is the wrong way to go, I'm going to argue. You know, there's lots of cool things. You should learn about quantum mechanics because it's so utterly cool and the mysteries are so worth exploring. But the idea that somehow quantum mechanics shows us that the world is sacred, you know, because it, because it is in line with contemplative insights, I think is, is a mistake and we're setting ourselves up for problem uh, if we do that. Better still are things that have happened in the last you know, 10 years or so beyond thinking, you know, where in science do we find these, the ability to grasp holes, to grasp holism? And that is in some amazing developments that have happened over the last 20 years. Um, in particular, network theory. Network theory is this emerge, the science that has emerged, which um, you know, looks at individual actors and the relationship between them. So that, those actors could be a network of genes that turn on and turn off. It could be a social network, as you all know. It could be a food web. Um, but the great thing about network theory, it has this inherent ability to deal with a whole and the relationships. You know, have the parts and the, and the relationships create a whole that has emergent properties, things you didn't necessarily expect. And along with this comes something called complex adaptive systems, which is you know, just mind-blowing in, um, uh, in some of its ideas. Like, for the example that, you know, what is a cell but a network that has a boundary on it you know, that allows things to pass you know, across, back and forth? And the boundary is just, you know, it's just the quarks don't know that, that they're part of a boundary, right? It's a bunch of molecules that exist only for a certain amount of time. And the only reason it's a boundary is because it says, it can say, oh, that molecule I'm letting in, that's a signal, and that molecule I'm not letting in, right? And how does it do that? How does it know? How does it know what's a signal and what's just noise, right? And so there's, I think there, these are approaches that embrace the relative and the absolute in really profound new ways that I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of fertile thinking that can happen. But now I want to go back. So, you know, so if, you know, if you're going to look for places in science that are really kind of mind-blowing, and actually I do think have uh, uh, connections with contemplative science, I would argue those are better places to explore. But now I want to push back on the science, on the, this, this scientism, uh, the philosophy behind it. The first one is the objective frame, the idea of like science is all about finding the God's eye view, the objective reality. And, you know, I, uh, there's this great book by Thomas Nagel, which he, ta he calls it The View from Nowhere. And that is a perfect, perfect uh, uh, way of thinking about it. Because who's ever had that, right? It is literally a picture of the world that no one has ever had. And in that sense, it's nonsense. You know, it's a great story. It's very helpful to us. You know, we can do amazing things with it. But to think that that is actually the basal structure, that is actually the ground of the, you know, is literally, it's a fiction. So how could that, how could this thing that no one ever, has ever had experience of um, be the ground of reality, right? So that's the first thing we can push back against, that there's no such thing as the objective frame. It's an it's a, it's a, uh, approximation um, that is useful to us. Okay? So from that, I will say the, my, my big claim is that you know, we're always looking for the thing that's irreducible. Atoms, oh, those are irreducible. It turned out like, no, no, atoms are made out of protons and electrons. Well, okay, protons are irreducible. It's like, no, 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 really, they're made of quarks. You know. So we've just been doing this for a while. But actually, what's irreducible is experience. Right? Experience. You know, people talk about consciousness. I, I don't like the word consciousness because consciousness already reifies. It's a thing. You know, do you have consciousness? Do you not have consciousness? What I cannot get away from is experience until I die. And then who knows what happens, right? So experience, this you know, life world, uh, you know, phenomenal, you know, phenomenologists, I thought, really, you know, nailed it. The, the, the life world, uh, the idea of a Dasein, that, you know, we are, we are a, a being with a there. That's what's irreducible. Um, and so that's the only basal structure. And so then that turns the question that science, we usually think about science and uh, the world and fundamental nature of the world on its head. Because usually a physicist will ask, um, how do we situate experience within physics and science? You know, well, how do I go from, you know, and the reductionist claim is I can go from electrons and build my way up to consciousness because it's just going to be, you know, just another thing that's happening in the world. Um, but if you take this perspective, then you have to flip it around. It's how do you situate physics and science inside of the totality, the unity that is experience, 
right? Because science, um, you know, I mean, I, I never had a chance to meet Francisco Varela. I wish I did, because that last quote, I mean, it's like, oh my God, I would have, you know, sat at his feet uh, to learn, because that's exactly, I complete, com agree completely. Science is a very particular, it's a particular kind of behavior within experience, right? There's lots of things you do. You find yourself in the world, you got to eat, you have social relations. Science is just one of the things you can do, and it's a way of identifying um, uh, uh, things that are in, seem to be invariant, and you know, you have, but you have to pull those out. It takes a lot of uh, 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 there's a lot of steps between you know feeling cold and the idea of temperature, right? So the real thing is to ask. You know, you start with ex experience, and what is it that you do that you can get something like physics, right? And what does that mean? Um, so you know, yeah, what would happen if we actually pursued the question in this way, rather than trying to have a theory of consciousness? Let's have a theory of physics given what uh, given experience. So, you know, for me, this actually allows you to reimagine the metaphysics of scientific practice. And the hope would be that once you do that, it also will seep down uh, and become part of a reimagining of the world we build with science, including, as we were talking about yesterday, you know, the, the, the technologies, the tools that we build. So just a moment to think about reduction versus non-reductionism. So, you know, reductionism, as I've said, you know, takes science, it takes human experience and situates it within uh, physics uh, and, and science. So, you know, this is actually, I, I wrote a textbook, an intro astronomy textbook, and this is one of the uh, uh, slides we had. We were trying to explain to people, you know, about Galilean invariance, you know, if you, uh, you know, how, does, how do velocities add, right? How do you do that calculation? And so, you know, this is a nice view of like, here's somebody looking at an experience, you know, there's the river and there's a boat on the river and how do you add things up? But the idea basically of that is like, yeah, sure, what's going on in there, it's just a biological computer, you know? End of story, right? So, you know, you've got a point of view, you've got a perspective, but, you know, there's nothing special about that perspective. Anybody can have a perspective. In fact, actually, anything can have a perspective, right? And again, that's very useful for science, but it's actually not anybody's reality, right? Um, we all have perspective, and we can't get away from that perspective. And what cracks me up about the God's eye view is that when you ask people, you know, when I ask scientists to imagine their objective reality, all they're doing is, like, imagining themselves sort of floating over a planet, <laughs> looking down on it, you know? It's like, that's that's you just you know that's not the objective reality that's just you floating over a planet so you know <laughs> what does perspectiveless perspective look like so the answer is this right I mean this is what's beautiful about contemplative practice before the distinction is made before the distinction between you know the tree and the grass next to it is made there is, you know, there's a world before distinction. That's what contemplative practice is driving us towards. You know, so, so before systematization, um, before we wrap things, you know, before I wrap this cup in conceptual saran wrap and call it a cup as opposed to um, the table, uh, something else is going on. And so the question is, how can, you know, with science, as Varela said, how can you do that? Like, that's the interesting question. How might, doesn't, it's at, as, you know, as um, uh, my teacher, um, says that doesn't mean it's all a, 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 an oatmeal. It's not all mush, right? If you take this view, it doesn't mean oh, it's all mush. There's nothing you can say. There, that's the question. Or what can you still say with this? And so one of the things I loved from Heidegger, who I you know, love as a philosopher, there's that whole Nazi problem, but we can go on that later <laughs> on. Um, <laughs> I really don't know what to do with that. But uh, circumspec circumspection, not circumcision, circumspection, the idea that to see the world, three, you know, without perspective, right? Is there, that is sort of what, uh, in some sense, one is aiming at. And what exactly that means is an open question. But I love these pictures, right? Because this, you know, this, 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 this circumsection, what this show, shows would look utterly different. You know, it's not our normal way of apprehending the world. Um, Okay, so this leads me now. So circumspection is so different, and it's so tied, I think, to what happens in contemplative practice that it naturally takes us to questions. Because why are we doing contemplative practice? Well, you know, one reason we're doing it is to connect with the sacred, to connect with our sense of spirituality and sacredness. So that brings us back to um, sort of thinking about what sacredness is. And of course, there's this amazing book, The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, which I leaned on a lot in my first book. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, he, this was a major departure in what, uh, when he wrote this book because most people were thinking about religion much the way we think about science, which was like, oh, we're going to analyze it and, you know, what, is, you know, what's, uh, you know what, what are the four features of a religion? What aren't? And he said, you know, the problem I have set myself to defend is experience against philosophy as being the real backbone of religious life. And I just thought, like, wow, that for me, you know, framed it. Because, you know, I've, all my whole life I've been having spiritual experiences through science. Um, so uh, that beautiful, uh, in the talk yesterday of the, um, 
the experience of the bowl and the, you know, the, the, the music. I had an experience so closely related to that. I was taking a class, a, 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 a differential equations class. We were learning about the vibrating membrane. And we were writing down all the equations, doing all the ornate, baroque, beautiful math associated with a vibrating membrane that is excited at the rim. Um, and uh, you know, so all the, all the different possible patterns were in these few lines of math. And then I went and uh, uh, the class was over, and I you know, walk out, my, my you know, mind's blown. And I went and got a cup of coffee at the student center, and I was about to pay for it, and I put it down on the um, refrigerator that was right there. Uh, you know, got my money, and I looked out, and because the refrigerator was vibrating, there was the pattern. Right? And I swear to God, it was an experience. It was a spiritual experience. And it was also an experience of love. I mean, really, love for the world. Like, oh my God. You know? And I had just seen it codified into this, this language, this poetic language of math. It was, you know. Um, so, you know, I've always experienced science as being something that leads to sacred experience of the sacred. So, you know, that's. You know, if we, if we look at asking what character of, of experience, what po possibilities in it have sacredness in them, then we might also ask where in science is sacredness. Um, and so, you know, okay, now we have to define what is sacred, which is, ay, vey, you know, this is, um, that's not going to be easy. But the cool thing is when I went back and looked at this, if you look at the Latin roots, people, you know, often if you're talking to atheists, which, you know, a lot of, because I'm a scientist, I'm often talking with people who are atheists, it's really cool to say, look, you know, this has nothing to do with the Catholic religion, whatever religion you were born in. It actually comes from the Latin, uh, and it's about, it's about Roman temple architecture. Right? So the, the, the sacrum and the profanum, which we now think of as the sacred and profane, were actually parts of the Roman temple. The outside, the profanum, was the front of the temple, where you could do whatever you want. You could sell your Grateful Dead you know, tapes or whatever, you know, uh, your shea butter. Um, you know, but the, sacer, the sacrum was inside the temple. It was walled off. And it was a place where you, you know, your attitude had to change when you went in there. Um, it was a place that belonged to the gods. And it was, so that meant to say the sacred is a kind of location in space and time. And in particular, it's a location in space and time where you have that experience. So that brings us to um, Marcia Iliade, whose writings, you know, uh, really enjoyed a lot when I was doing work on the book. The idea of the heriphony, right? We know about epiphanies, right? Ah, oh, I've had an epiphany. A heriphany is like that, but it's associated with the sacred. So um, a heriphany is where the exper experience of the sacred manifests itself. And it could be in here when you're sitting. It could be when you're out walking in the woods and you come to like, you know, a ravine or something that just has that power, right? And, you know, certainly um, uh, societies, you know, the hunter-gatherer societies were very tuned to this. That's why, you know, a glade would become sacred, a tree, a stone would become sacred, and rituals and rites would be practiced there. But the thing I wanted to argue about, well, okay, so the sacred is the, it's the sense of the holy other, right? Normally in our day-to-day -day world, you know, we're just washing the dishes, we're doing whatever, we don't usually have this sense, but the sacred has the possibility of erupting into our lives. And my argument has always been that science and its fruits are heriphanies, right? The things that are in science, just like that, that was a heriphany with the, um, yeah, I'm pointing to the cup of coffee that's not there. Um, that experience I had was a heriphany. And we all have this, you know, um, now people, you know, science doesn't generally want to admit this, but just go watch any NOVA program, say about the universe, right? And it'll start off with the beautiful image of the Milky Way galaxy spiraling majestically, and there will be an orchestral score which will rise, and you'll feel this sense of like, oh my God. And it's like, that wasn't put there by accident. Right? We're using the tools of art to invoke an experience of the sacred. Right? Science has its roots in that experience. It's why people initially you know, started doing it. It's why I do it. Um, it's why most scientists do it. So it's recognizing that science actually acts as a heriphany. It's one of the ways we allow the sacred or draw the sacred closer to ourselves. Okay? So in that way, science can reveal the world's sacred depths. Um, and, you know, recognizing this, I think, uh, Liz uh, gives us a kind of a path forward in thinking about um, science in the world. So what we want to do is we want to reimagine science's role in the world as a way of getting ourselves out of the mess we're in. Because science is going to be part of it, right? There's no way, you know, there's certain clocks we just can't turn back. Um, so we have to reimagine what the tools are used for or how they're deployed. Um, uh, you know, particularly if we have this sort of sense that science is a tool for sacredness. I mean, it's not that people haven't taken you know, tools of sacredness and used them to kill each other. God knows that's part of history. But just um, as we were talking about yesterday, the idea that you, know, you can invoke religious leaders, you can bring them in and hopefully have them see the sacredness of you know, the elephants and use that as a call to better action. Having um, 
you know, recognizing that science has this sacred character can also be used, you know, if we can make those connections, to, uh, to be careful about its deployment. What is, it, what is it being used for and how is it being used? And to what ends? And this, is the, this other point for here is very important. Who claims to speak for science's worldview, right? You'll often get that, like, oh, this is just science. Um, I forgot who it was yesterday. He was talking about the, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the nurse who had this experience with the babies. And they were like, you can't touch those babies, you know, because those are the hospital rules, and those hospital rules are scientific. It's like, well, who says who? You know, how, how do you get to speak for science? What does it mean to speak for science? And, you know, and what's, what implicit philosophy are you um, uh, invoking when you say you speak for science? So recognizing science as a heriphony, I think, a place where um, the sacred occurs is important because as Iliade said, you know, human beings have always sought out the sacred because it's a kind of power, you know, and, and you know, human beings for various reasons want power. It's the reason why religions end up as political, you know, being so political, it can be so deadly in their worst aspects. But we should recognize that the sacred has its power um, and, and, you know, use that to change science's relationship with the world. And in particular, and so now we're about to make a shift, um, uh, you can help, it will help you find the proper relationship between this question of the relative, our own lives, the suffering we encounter, the suffering of others we encounter, and this large view, the large view, the absolute view, the cosmic view, which is often inherent in science. Um, so now I want to take a little shift now to sort of think about that, uh, that large view. So first we have to situate ourselves, right? So you are here. These are the, um, all the stars, the nearest stars within tw uh, about, yeah, 12 light years or so. So there's, there's us at the center. There's Proxima Centauri. We've just found a planet uh, around this system. Um, uh, Bernard star, you know, these are all these stars. The interesting thing to think about, so 10 light years, if, if we take the technology we can imagine now and extrapolate it, we're lucky if we're going to get to 100 uh, a hundredth of the light speed, which means to get to any of these stars could take as you know a hundred years or so, or longer, a thousand years to get to these stars. So you know, if we're going to be lucky if we can get to a hundredth or a tenth of light speed, which means that for the you know the next few millennia, this is our playground if we can even get there. Right? The playground may be just the solar system and the worlds in the solar system, but if anything, this is humanity's future for the next foreseeable you know thousands of years, unless a miracle occurs, you know, and we invent a warp drive. Okay, but that you have to situate. This is the. This is now. We're now zooming out uh, 200 and, or 10 times or so. This is all the stars in uh, within 250 light years. And what I love about this, if you go between this and that, look every one of these dots, right? You know, if you were to start here and sort of you know look away and look back, if it wasn't for that arrow, you wouldn't know where the sun was anymore. You very quickly are lost in this field of stars. And this is like this is the local neighborhood of the Milky Way. Okay, so many stars, so many possibilities. And then we zoom out again, another factor of 10 or so, and now you start to see the actual structure of the Milky Way, right? Forget, you know, if, again, if I didn't have these little lines on here, would you ever be able to find where the sun was? The sun and the earth and all of the suffering and all of the joy and all of the hopes. Um, you couldn't even find it. Couldn't even find where it was happening. And then, of course, there's the Milky Way itself, 400 billion stars in just the Milky Way. 400 billion. Um, you know, it's a number, it's like virtual. I can say it, you know, but what does it mean, right? It's essentially uncountable. Um, there is a koan, which I just was working on, uh, which is, you know, uh, count all the stars in the sky, you know, which was uh, yeah, as, as a koan, as a question. Um, so then you can zoom out even further, and you see, like, oh, my God, there's other galaxies around, right? You know, within 500,000 light years, there's actually other galaxies. Um, so most of them are kind of small. This is kind of an interesting subject from the astronomy point of view. Um, but, uh, yeah, and then, of course, we can keep going. We, you know, we can zoom out and zoom out, and then you start seeing, you know, uh, uh, structures of galaxies. What are called, you know, there's, there's galaxy clusters, and then on larger scales, there's you know, uh, uh, super clusters. So, but you get the point, right? So, you know, where exactly are we? It doesn't matter, right? How can it matter? How can it matter um, on these star scales? So it's very, yeah, right. It's the Bill Murray thing. How can it matter? Um, so, you know, so, you know, and I just threw this in. Because I could also do this, are you here now, right? But I could also do this in time, right? We could look at the universes. The universe has been around for about 13.6 billion, or 13.7 billion years. And so we could play the same game with time, trying to imagine these amazing scales. But what do we do with that? Like, how can that, you know, is, is you know, is it, for some people, this is really depressing, right? It's, I'll, I'll give talks and people are like, oh my God, the universe is so big. I feel so bad, you know? But I'm like, it's awesome, you know, oh, my car broke down, whatever, you know? Um, 
I really, I have always found it to be enormously comforting because, you know, I screwed up, right? Whatever, you know? <laughs> I didn't get that check to you. I'm sorry, you know? Um, but I actually think this view actually, this actually, this view can teach us things. It actually can be surprising. Um, in the talk yesterday, the idea that, you know, you're looking for the surprising connections because that's often where things can happen. So now I want to close the last, uh, yeah, half hour or so. Um, I'm going to talk about... Um, the climate change and the role that our understanding, this absolute view, this large-scale view, can give us um, about climate change. Uh, so as I've uh, said, you know, I, I work for, on top of my being a scientist, I also am a science writer. Adam, yeah? What I'd like to suggest is that we just take a breath. <laughs> sure, if you want to take a time, like a little stretch, a little seventh inning stretch. Because <laughs> we're shifting gears. <laughs> That's all that's good for me. I think that's a good idea, actually. Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to walk around the table. <laughs> this is my keen heen. I'm going to do keen heen. <laughs> and I'm not going to trip over this. All right. Everybody got their beer and peanuts? So you're good? Yeah. All right. Billion years? Because there's a debate right now about. <laughs> no, there is a We can go into that question after. It's at three, the question is whether it's 3.7 or 3.8 billion years. Yeah. Careers are built over this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, climate change is a contentious issue, which is funny because it shouldn't be, right? It should just be science, right? You know, the, uh, the uh, radiative properties of a carbon dioxide molecule do not care what color tie you're wearing, right? It doesn't care who you voted for. Uh, you know, it doesn't care, you know, whether or not you drive a pickup truck, you know, or a Prius. And yet somehow climate change, the, this process, has become part of the polarization that you know, infects every aspect of American life now. Um, so this 10,000 foot, because it's fundamentally a scientific, uh, you know, or, or a, a, a sort of a, a question that is addressed by science, um, we can ask if we take this 10,000 foot view, how does it change the way perhaps we talk about climate change? And so I'm gonna introduce you to something I call the astrobiology of the Anthropocene now. Um, as a way of sort of looking at climate change differently and I think what I'm going to argue is that really we have climate change all wrong when we think about it, right, and the way we talk about it. And it's actually holding us back. So um, I will define what both of these terms are. But before I want to sort of uh, get started, I want to frame sort of why we do this. You can't solve a problem until you understand what that problem is. And you can't understand it until you know how to tell its story. Okay? And the story we're trying to tell is the human future on a climate-changed world. Right? That's the story I think that we have all wrong. And there is a new story that we can tell by you know, uh, adopting, by understanding how what's happening to us relatively fits into the, uh, the, the absolute view. So um, for those of you who have never heard, I'm sure everybody here has heard it, but the Anthropocene. What is the Anthropocene? Um, it's basically a new geological era that is uh, being triggered by human activity that right now on a bunch of different levels we can see that human beings are pushing stuff around, chemicals, uh, you know, pushing on certain processes more than other things in the earth, more than the earth's, you know, quote unquote, natural processes. So it was in 2002 that a number of scientists suggested that, you know, when we look at the uh, stratigraphy, I can never pronounce that, the strata of rock, that if someone were to look, you know, 10 million years from now, they would see a layer that identifies when we appeared and the forcing that we call, you know, that's what us scientists call it, forcing, pushing on the planetary systems. Um, so the Anthropocene is this new era that we have pushed the Earth into. Um, and uh, there's some debate about, you know, whether or not uh, in, in the strata when it should actually appear, but that's not really important. It's basically the understanding that human beings now are like the dominant force changing the behavior 
of the what we'll call the coupled Earth systems. And I'll get back to that, what that means in a second. So that's the idea of the Anthropocene, and is most you know, beautifully shown by this picture at night, right? This is not what the Earth looked like at night for most of its 4.5 billion year history. Okay, so this is a new development for the planet. Um, so, okay, so what does the 10,000 light year view give us about thinking about the Anthropocene? And to do that, we have to take on a new subject, which uh, is still all, just like you know, Anthropocene studies, is relatively new, and it's called astrobiology. And what that means is the study of life in its planetary context, thinking about how life, uh, you know, what has happened on the Earth, what's happened here, and what could happen elsewhere. Um, and so, you know, by planetary, I also mean astronomical, because I have to ask myself, you know, what is going on in terms of the, how does the, the sun affect the Earth? How do asteroids affect the Earth? How, you know, I have to look at the big picture, or any planet. Now, some people can say, like, well, we've only got one example. How can you have a whole field? Um, and that's true. We still have an N equals one problem. But I'm going to show you, actually, how much progress we've actually made in pushing forward, because what we've been doing is we've been, you know, we have a lot of other planets around to actually look at. So, so if you take that view, you're actually missing how much our understanding of this planetary context for life uh, has changed. So in particular, there have been three profound revolutions in astrobiology over the last 20 years. And I'm going to talk about them in more detail, but they are, quickly, the discovery of planets orbiting other stars, the exploration of our own solar system, and the exploration of Earth's own past. So these are these three profound transformations that have happened in just the last two, maybe three decades that really change how we think about life and planets. OK, the first one is exoplanets. When I was coming up in school, um, we didn't know whether or not there were any other solar systems in the universe. You can actually find the Greeks arguing about this. Were there any other planets? Do any of us stars have planets? Um, and so this is a 2,500-year-old question, which is, of course, essential for life. Because, you know, I mean, who knows what could happen? But in general, if we're talking about life that we understand, um, you're going to need a planet. You need a surface for it to happen. So planets are probably, you know, the, 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 the prerequisite for life. And for a long time, actually, until fairly, until at least the 1950s, we thought planets were very rare that it could be only one in a trillion solar. We thought it was an accident, basically, that you got planets. And then along comes 1995, and we discovered our first exoplanet, which is amazing. How often do you get a 2,500-year-old question answered? Right? And it was answered definitively. And then because of um, new uh, technologies like the Kepler mission, which was a space uh, telescope, small space telescope, we actually you know, went from just, oh my god, we've got planets, to actually doing a census of the universe, of, of the planets, of planets in the, in the galaxy. And we now know that every star in the sky, every star you look at at night has worlds, has a family of worlds. That is profound. And if you count up five, one of them is going to have a planet in the right place for life to form. It's going to have liquid water, you know, uh, potentially on its surface. And so, you know, you got to think about every one of those worlds, that's a place. You know, that's a place where winds blow, where there's oceans, you know, most of, some of them are going to have oceans, they're going to have canyons where, you know, uh, fog forms in the morning and burns off at night. They're all places, right? So this was an incredible revolution, and we now know, you know, we've been dis discovering lots of worlds that are in the right place now, as I said, to, for life to form. So that was revolution number one. We now know that the universe is awash in planets. <laughs> the second revolution was um, we uh, pretty much have sent a robot emissary to every kind of object in the solar system. Right? The solar system is a rich and very varied place. It's not, it's not dead, you know, we can define what I mean by that at all, though. There's really amazing uh, differences between the worlds, and we've seen them, right? And one of the things that's really important is we've seen climate on all these worlds. We have computer models of Mars's climate that can predict the weather tomorrow on Mars very accurately. So when anyone tells you that, like, oh, those climate models are all crap, it's like, oh, yeah, well, I guess they don't work for Mars either, huh? Or Venus, or Titan, or Jupiter, right? Because that's the stupidity of that view. It's like, you know, we don't just know about climate on Earth. We've learned about climate on Earth because we've known so much and we've learned so much from other worlds. And one of the things we've seen about other worlds is that um, they change, right? Uh, so this is Mars. This is not a picture of Earth. That's a picture of Mars probably about four billion years ago. We now, I mean, for sure, Mars was once a blue world. Now, exactly what that meant and whether or not you know, there was a life ever formed, those are open questions. But we are, we're very certain of this, that Mars once had a, you know, a world of oceans. Um, and what happened to it? It changed. Well, there's a lesson for us, right? You know, habitability, you know, which is a big word in astronomy. You know, can a planet, is it habitable for life? That can change with time. So that's a lesson for us in thinking about sustainability. 
Revolution number three is understanding of the Earth itself. The uh, coming to understand the Earth's history, the 4.5 billion year uh, history of the Earth. So I love this, uh, this uh, beautiful piece of artwork. You know, these are all the eras of Earth's eras and epochs. Somebody who knows more about geology can tell me the difference between eras and epochs. Um, but basically, you know, uh, you know, this is the dinosaur times, and these are the, you know, the, the trilobite times. And here we are, up in the Holocene, right? The last 10,000 years since the, you know, when the ice age, last ice ages ended, we entered the Earth, the Earth's climate state, and so the, all these different periods were radically different climate states. Um, and uh, the Holocene has been a time relatively wet and relatively, uh, relatively warm and relatively moist, which is great for agriculture, okay? And the entire uh, history of human civilization, and by that I mean everything after agriculture, we settled ourselves, you know, we domesticated ourselves essentially, you know, started living in, in um, villages, those villages turned into cities, those cities led to our specialization, um, you know, technology, explosion of technology, that's all the Holocene, okay? The Holocene is the epoch in which Basically, civilization was born and has flourished. And it's not at all clear that civilization, our kind of civilization, can exist in one of those other ones. Certainly not if it's an abrupt transition from one to the other. But most of all, what we've understood is that all of these different uh, transition, all of these different transitions were all about the dynamics of what we call the coupled Earth systems. So it's not just, there's not just the atmosphere. There's the hydrosphere, which is the oceans and the rivers and you know, all the movement of water. There's the cryosphere. The ice plays very important roles, which are different from, the, you know, the frozen water acts differently or plays different roles than the, the liquid water. Um, the geosphere, the rock, right? Weathering, what happens as you release minerals from rocks in weathering and how that affects the, the, the whole climate system. And then there's the biosphere. That was a radical uh, uh, idea that the, the people used to think of life as just being some kind of scruff, some green crud on top of the planet and really didn't matter. And it was people like Verdansky, uh, who first, he was the, guy, the Russian geophysicist who um, coined the term biosphere. And then it was people like uh, Lynn Margellis and James Lovelock, you know, with the Gaia hypothesis, who showed that like, you know, you can't take life for granted. Life and the rest of the systems, life is a major player. So now we come to this very important idea of co-evolution. You can't separate life out. In fact, the only reason right now, everybody take a deep breath, It's funny, right? Breathing is so much part of our practice. That's only because of life, right? In fact, the Earth, you could have landed, if you'd landed on Earth, on Earth about 2.5 billion years ago, when there was already life all over the place, and you stepped out of your spaceship, the first thing that would happen is you would die because you'd asphy asphyxiate. There was no oxygen in the atmosphere. The oxygen came from the activity of blue-green, well, you know, we don't call it anymore blue-green algae, uh, but that basically, through a, a new form of photosynthesis, started kicking out oxygen. So, you know, and it led to a, a huge mass extinction. Um, you know, so, you know, life, and we, we know from the history of the Earth that life can change the atmosphere dramatically. Uh, it doesn't usually end up going very well for the life that did it. You know, the, all, that, all those organisms now have to live in your gut. You have to live in non-oxygen aided warrens. Um, but, you know, the planet, uh, the life and the planet have been co-evolving for billions of years. Okay. So what is the, okay, so that's astrobiology. Wow, huge, you know, powerful, potent questions. But what is the, how does this relate to climate change? And so what I'll say is that uh, I want to raise the issue of the astrobiological question, which is this, right? We talk about sustainability. Oh, my God, we got to make a sustainable version of our civilization. But what if that's not something the universe does? What if with all those planets and all those potential biospheres that you know, there's no such thing as a long-term sustainable version of our civilization, right? We know the universe makes comets, it makes black holes, big stars, but how do we know that like on this list are sustainable energy intensive? I mean, civilizations like ours where we harvest huge amounts of energy, that each one of us has the equivalent of 50 servants because of the energy we harvest uh, and build civilization with it. How do we know that there is a long-term version of that? So that's the question you can pose with this absolute 10,000 light year view. And if you want to get specific, this astrobiological perspective allows you to ask questions like, you know, how our study of planets and, or study, excuse me, are the studies of the coupled relationship between life, planets, and their co-evolution, uh, co how can those make us think about what's happening, you know, now and our path through it, our path through the Anthropocene differently? And more importantly, can we see, perhaps Anthropocenes are generic. Right? This transition that we're going through, that we're all arguing about, what if that's just something that happens all the time? Right? So let me talk about that for a little bit, the idea that we're not the first time this has happened. Okay, 
So how common are, so here's specific questions, how common are Anthropocenes, how fatal are they, right? You know, does every, anybody who goes through an Anthropocene, you know, any civilization, you know, does it, does it kill them? And this actually you want to ask is what is the average lifetime of a civilization, right? Is your, if we, you know, if I could look across the universe and I could look at all the trajectories of all the civilizations across space and time, if the average lifetime was like 200 years, we're in big trouble. Right? But if the average lifetime is 2 million years, then it means there, we have more, there's more play in the system. Right? There's more, you can make mistakes and recover. And then finally, what are the properties that characterize planets with long-term civilizations? All right, but let's, uh, let's, oh yeah, before we go there, right? So I want to talk about Anthropocenes being generalized. Obviously, you know, I'm talking about aliens. Right? You know, which of course, right, there's the problem with aliens is the snicker factor, right? But we want to take them seriously. And I want, so I'm not going to use the word alien right now. I'm going to use the word exo civilizations, right? We talk about exoplanets. There's a huge amount of work going on about exobiospheres, right? So it'd be crazy not to like, oh, but you can't talk about exo civilizations. So we need to take exo civilizations seriously. Not, for right now, I'm not interested in detection. Um, and we're not, there's not much we can do with biology, and there's not much we can do with sociology. We just don't have any scientific constraints. Who knows what evolution produces, you know, in terms of, you know, they look like lizards, they have six sexes rather than two. These are questions, I think, that they're just pure speculation. Um, so, you know, we can't touch those questions with our science now. But the one, what's amazing is the one place where we can actually ask questions about Alien, about exocivilizations is the one that matters most for us, which is what is the interaction between a planet and an, exo, an energy-intensive exocivilization. And we can do that because we don't have to ask any questions about sociology. We don't have to ask any questions about biology. We just have to know about how dumping energy into a planet, which is what a civilization does, how it affects the planet. And then sort of what the feedback would be on, this, on, the, planet, on the civilization's population. So we can do very simple population dynamics models to ask this question. Okay? But as I said, the problem with thinking about aliens is prosthetic foreheads, right? I mean, we've had so many years of bad science fiction where the aliens all have, you know, an antenna or, you know, big, big brain that there's this giggle factor. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm here to tell you is that, like, you know, we are really at a profound moment in human history uh, where, you know, this is not, we are so close to actually having evidence for, at least having data about life in the universe. So with all these exoplanets, we are in the next 20 or 30 years going to be able to characterize with the light we get from them, their atmospheres, what's going on in their atmospheres. So we're gonna be able to tell whether or not there's things like oxygen and methane, which should not be there unless there's life. So we're gonna have data on this. So instead of just like you know, 2,500 years of people yelling at each other, we're now actually gonna have data to answer these questions. Now who knows what the answer is gonna be, but we're actually, so we're living at a remarkable moment in human history. And there, I think it's no, it's not an accident. This is also the moment that climate change is, is hitting. I think those actually may be coupled because of the technologies required to both ask, ask, ask the questions about other civilizations or other planets in life and the technologies that drive climate change. Okay, so we want to take aliens seriously. So now let's talk about aliens just for a minute or two. Um, compassion, climate change, and aliens. So the, the, the er way of thinking about aliens is um, what's uh, called the Drake equation. And so Drake was, Frank Drake was the first guy to ever do models of, or sorry, to ever search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He was the first guy who took a big radio telescope and pointed it <laughs> at the universe. Um, and so, but to, he was asked to convene a meeting um, where to look at, uh, you know, what are, what are the odds of actually uh, finding alien civilizations? And so he came up with this famous equation. We don't have to go through it in detail. But basically, N was the number of, uh, of civilizations out there to communicate with now, right? And then all these other terms, they were just, they were, you know, they were sort of estimates of our ignorance. So there was how many stars are there now? What fraction of those stars have planets? Um, how many planets are, exist in those systems that have planets? Um, or how many, yeah, how many planets are in the right place? And then these three terms, which are interesting, what fractions of those planets form life? What fraction of that life goes on to intelligence? What fraction of that intelligence develops technology? And then finally, here's that all-important li lifetime. How long does a civilization last? And so you put all these together, and you would find, if you knew the values for all these, you could tell how many civilizations were out there right now to try and communicate with, right? Um, and the important thing to understand is when uh, Drake came up with this equation, only one term was known, only that first one, the, the thing that had to do with the number of stars. Now, the first through all the terms that have to do with astronomy have been nailed. That is remarkable. We now know for sure what these three terms are. Okay, so um, when all this, uh, asked, uh, all this exoplanet data came out, a collaborator of mine named Woody Sullivan 
asked, like, you know, this data must be useful for something. Isn't there something we can say about exo-civilizations, right? You know, we've got all this data about exoplanets. Can't we do something that will help us with exo-civilizations? And it turns out they, there is, but it's in a funny way. It's not, you know, we can't tell you how many exo-civilizations there are out there. Instead, what we could do is we could put a limit on the probability that we were alone, truly alone. Alone in the sense that there's never, ever been another civilization in the universe. So we had to take Drake's equation. I won't go through this, but we had to sort of, you know, first we had to get rid of the lifetime factor. So we weren't interested in whether they existed now. We just wanted to know whether they ever existed. Um, and then, you know, we played a few games. And what we were able to do is we were able to come up with what we called the pessimism line. And this was, this was the probability. This is what the probability per planet, per habitable zone planet, had to be for us to be alone. Right? How bad do things have to get for us to be the only time it's ever happened in the cosmic history? And it turns out that number, you can get a hard empirical number on it, and it's 10 to the minus 22. One in 10 billion trillion. So what does that mean explicitly? It means that unless, it means that unless nature is incredibly perversely against civilizations to the tune of one in 10 billion trillion, then it has happened before. Right? Another way of looking at this is if you had a bag, the only way we could be alone is if you had a bag of 10 billion trillion planets and you were pulling them out and you didn't find a single civilization on, on any of them. Right? So 10, you know, bill, 1 in 10 billion trillion is so small that like, you know, yeah, unless nature is really biased against it, this has happened before. There have been other civilizations, there have been other histories. Right? And I find that absolutely remarkable. Um, so, for example, even if nature chose, you know, evolution chose a probability per planet of 10 to the minus 13, which would be like 10 uh, trillion, um, there would still be a billion histories. There will have been a billion stories of civilizations waking up on their planet, you know, having some kind of history, and either dying or going on. A billion of those. Um, so we're not the first. We're not alone in that sense. I don't know if anybody's, you know, the galaxy could be totally sterile now. It's not, that's not the important point. It's that it has happened before. And those trajectories are the things that we can ask about, right? So the Anthropocene, I'm going to argue, is that, and so I won't go into this argument in any detail because we're coming to the, towards the end, is that um, it's really almost impossible to not have. If you build a civilization like ours, a world-girdling civilization, you can't stop an Anthropocene. You're gonna, you know, the planets have feedback. You can't pretend there's no such thing as no impact when you're, you know, this kind of civilization. So um, the Anthropocene has happened before, and there's going to be stories of suffering in that way too. There's a kind of cosmic samsara with a civilization facing difficult choices this way. Okay, well, I'm going to cut through this. Um, so what does this, I can come back to that if anybody wants to, but, uh, you know, because we did models. We actually, we have a new paper coming out where we actually modeled this interaction between civilizations and their planets to look for the generic trajectories. Um, but I, we'll come back to that if anybody wants to know. But what I'm interested in closing now, because I only have five minutes, is to say, what does this change for us? Okay, I'm okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. You want to know? <laughs> what happens? <laughs> oh, you don't want to know. It's terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Trigger warning. <laughs> all right, well, look, look, I got equations. Right, this is funny. So these are, you know, I'm not going to go into this at all. But uh, this is to show you that, like, you know, I'm muy macho and I've got equations. Um, uh, this is so funny. You have to do this. Like, when I give a talk, I have to look at my equations. See, I'm not just, like, talking about aliens. I've got math, therefore it's real. Um, <laughs> So basically what we were doing, which, what's interesting is these equations come from, because I had to look around, this was you know, new domains for me, and I found the models, a version of the models I needed for with Easter Island. You know, is everybody familiar with Easter Island? Anybody not know about Easter Island? Okay, yeah, so Easter Island is like the, the Ur example of uh, uh, ecocide, a civilization just basically overshooting the carrying capacity of, the, of, its, uh, you know, of its environment and then just driving itself into collapse. And so um, that's where I found the models. I, you know, so in some sense, you know, I was able to adapt to them, or my collaborators and I were able to adapt them. You know, you have a civilization that has a population. It's using resources from the environment, which is the planet. The resources allow your birth rate to go up, right? So now, yay, you know, you got all this stuff. You can, um, you can have more babies. Um, but every baby uh, contributes more in terms of using the resources. The resource use feeds back on the planet. So actually, this equation right here is the population. This equation is the state of the planet. So you use the resources. The planet changes. The you know, think about temperature. The temperature rises on the planet, which makes it harder 
to, you know, live, right? So now your death rate goes up. Using the resources makes your birth rate go up, but the effect on the environment makes your death rate go up. And so it's this interplay between using the resources, changing the health of the planet, and then that feeding back on your population. Um, okay, so what did we find? What were the models that we look at? Have a little, moment, a little dramatic pause here. Okay, so in these plots, here's a bunch of, you know, we ran lots of models. Green is the population for this. That's the civilization population. Red, you can think of as the planetary temperature. It's the state of the planet. So we found various classes of behavior. These are very simple models, by the way. We even consider them toy models. But they're rich enough to have already a lot of behavior. So the first thing we found are what we call the die-off, which is where, you know, the civilization starts using the resources. Its population rises dramatically. Um, the planet starts heating up, the planet's state starts changes, and the, planet, the civilization overshoots the carrying capacity, basically overshoots how many individuals that planet can hold, and then the numbers come down, right? You see this, what we call the die-off, um, but then you eventually come to some kind of equilibrium. So, you know, we could see, say, sir, for example, 70% of the population dying after the, at, from the peak, after the peak. And, you know, okay, at least you came to a steady state, but imagine if seven out of every 10 people you knew died. Would you even be able to hold a civilization like ours together, right? You know, our food, most of it, right, arrives in this, you know, through trucks, you know, at a, at a supermarket. If seven out of ten people were to perish over a short period of time, it's not clear you could hold that kind of thing together. Uh, well, that's, that, that comes out of the models. It depends, right? You can see in some cases it can be very short, like an intergenerational time scale, and sometimes it's longer. So that's, you know, and these models are all, what are, they're all called, they're, they're all non-dimensionalized. So, you know, there's not an explicit time scale. But eventually we're going to get there where we'll have full climate models in this. Okay, the other was the, what we call the soft landing. Sure, the population comes up, the planet heats up, but there were solutions where, you know, you came to a nice steady state, no die-off, everybody's good. So that's, it's good to know that that's there. Um, Unfortunately, there was also the complete collapse. There were some models where civilization you know, is using the resources, um, the population comes up, and then the, basically the, the runaway effect. You know, planets have rules of their own, and so once you push on a planet, um, even if you stop pushing, it can still head off into another trajectory. And that's where we'd see the, the planet would just, the temperature would just skyrocket, and then the population would collapse. We even had models where the civilization changed from using a high-impact resource, oil, to a low-impact resource, like solar, and you would still collapse. You would see, like, you know, everything would get better for a while. You know, the planet would seem to kind of cool down a little bit, and the population would level off, and then, boom, it would still collapse. So those were the most troubling, right? Because you can even do the right thing, but if you do the right thing too late, you know, the system will still collapse. Okay, so there's good news and bad news there, but the amazing thing for me about this was, you know, it changes the way you think about this, right? And, and uh, you know, eventually we'll do more with it. Um, but now I want to ask, how does, how does this view that there have been perhaps billions of civilizations that have had Anthropocenes, um, and that we're just one of them, how does that change how we talk and think about uh, uh, the conflict in particular that climate change is going to generate for us? Because um, it's going to generate conflict. First is that Earth is going to be just fine. Thank you. We ha I'm going to argue we have to stop talking about saving the Earth, okay? Um, this is not a battle to save the Earth, right? We know of five mass extinctions, right? And each one of them turned out to be a remarkable opportunity for the biosphere. And if you don't believe me, take a deep breath. You're here because of the last mass extinction, right? So this is, I cannot pronounce this, the Isostrotodon. This is just basically your ancestor, right? This is your great, 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 great grandfather or grandmother. And you know, it was a rodent that was around during the time of the dinosaurs. But you know, when the dinosaurs got wiped out, that opened up niches, you know, and that's why we're here. That's why where the mammals came from. So you know, the Earth is not the problem. Um, so you know, what? Because of that, we have to reimagine, when we talk about sustainability, what exactly are we trying to sustain? And what are the moral imperatives that come along with that? So for example, we often show ourselves a picture like this when we talk about climate change, right? The lonely polar bear on the lonely ice float. And I always think it's kind of funny, like this obviously tugs at our heartstrings, but it's funny because like the polar bear is an amazing predator and it would rip your head off and drink your blood like that, you know? But somehow we're still like, oh, the polar bear! Like don't go and try and hug the polar bear, okay? Um, but so, right, so, but you know, but whatever. I mean, we're called and, you know, you know it, it, it's understandable that we're called to feel the suffering of this animal. On the other hand, right? Who's crying for the velociraptor, right? There used to be a lot of velociraptors. I was like, oh, the velociraptor, where is it, right? Earth churns through species. You know, they come, they play their role, 
and then they leave, right? And so, you know, we have to understand that's the truth of the earth. Um, because that leads to some really uh, important, all right, let me just be clear, because every time I get to this, people are like, oh my God, you don't think climate change is a problem, you hate polar bears, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, climate change is imminent, you know, and it's possibly an existential threat, and we have to do something immediately, right? But what I'm looking for is what is, how does this, what I think is the true absolute view of what we're triggering, um, how does it change, how should it change uh, the, our approach to it? So when we talk about sustainability, let's be honest. We're trying to sustain the conditions, the climactic conditions, that are amenable to a particular kind of human civilization, ours. That's really what we mean by sustainability, <laughs> right? It's technological. It's energy intensive. You know, unless somebody wants to vote to take themselves off the planet, it's going to have a relatively high population for a while. Right? You can't say, like, oh, we need to bring our numbers down, which we totally do. But, you know, who, who goes first, right? You know, you're going to have to, that's going to have to be a soft landing. And we also want it, and here's where the compassion comes, we want maximum well-being, right? That's what has to be folded into it. Well, that is part of what we want with sustainability. But when you think about that, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to hold the Holocene. We're trying to hold the Earth in some version of the Holocene that's good for us, right? And what right do we have to do that? Think about it. We're actually overdue for an ice age. Right? If it wasn't for climate change, we probably would be taking the first steps, the Earth would be taking the first steps into an IJs. And you can, there's people who have done models who show that actually we're already probably holding it off. What about the species that we're going to evolve in the next ice age? Right? We're, you know, if we, are, we reach full sustainability, those will never happen. Right? What it means is, and so what that reflects on is we're taking some kind of stewardship, or, or at least we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what is a different relationship with the biosphere where we're a player in it. Right? And there are ethical questions that come with that. Um, and so part of this also for me is, is about the importance of narrative, right? You know, so how we talk about climate change has to reflect these, uh, these changes. Because you know, I could show this plot to people forever, and it's not going to change anybody's. This has been the mistake that the science made in talking about climate change. We'll just show them more data. Most people don't understand their, their lives through data. They don't understand the world through data. They understand it through stories. And so we need a different story about the Anthropocene. Um, so with the right questions, these questions at the absolute view, I think you get a different story. So the wrong story is we're a plague on the planet. That just doesn't help anything. As I've said yesterday, it's not only um, wrong, it's also unhelpful. But the right story is we are what the biosphere is doing now, right? So as I mentioned yesterday, for a while it was dinosaurs, right? That was the experiment the biosphere was running. It was like, yay, you know, uh, triceratops, that's awesome. And then it was like um, grasslands. Grasslands were once an innovation, right? So there was like, hey, let's see what we can do with uh, grasslands. Um, so, but we, a technological civilization, is what the Earth is doing now. It's the experiment that it's running. And in that sense, a city is no different from a forest from the biosphere's perspective. So to say, let's say like, oh, cities are horrible, and forests are wonderful, you know, misinterprets where we are in the bio. We're not above it or below it or we're part of it, you know? And so the question is, you know, will we still be part? of what the biosphere is doing 10,000 years from now, right? Because the Earth will be more than happy to move on without us. You know, it's just like, oh, thank you. It'll say, oh, thank you for the climate change. It's great. I'm going to do some really interesting things with this. See you later, right? Um, and along with this, so the political question this, you know, that this raises is, you know, did we, did we cause climate change? People think that's the question. You know, that's what I have to endlessly debate with, you know, climate deniers. Oh, we, did we change climate? You know, did we, did we trigger climate change or not? And from this perspective, it's like, duh, of course you triggered. What did you expect? Right? You, you built a world-girdling civilization that uses a sizable fraction of the entire biosphere's net primary productivity. What did you expect? Right? And it's great because I've been able to stop climate deniers in their tracks with that. Not that that's the issue, you know, that's the goal, but it just it flips the script, I think, in a really useful way. Okay, now here's where I get into real, real problems. Right? So, um, you know, one of the things you can say, and I think this is really true, is that climate change is not our fault. And before you throw eggs at me, let me explain what I mean by that. You know, since the end of the last ice age, we've been building civilizations. It's what we do. We've har harvested whatever kind of energy was available to us, fire, you know, uh, dung, animal power, wind, and we've built our civilizations. We've built our cities, and we've built irrigation ditches. Um, and so when we found fossil fuels, it wasn't like we went, uh, <laughs> I will destroy the world with this black goo. <laughs> It was just like, really, it was awesome. It's like, oh my God, this stuff is great. You know, you can heat homes, you can build engines, right? So it wasn't like when we found fossil fuels, we were determined to be the greedy plague on the planet. It was an accident, you know, it was an unanticipated consequence of adopting a new kind of uh, uh, energy modality, which science, this process of science, allowed us to do. So in that sense, it was not our fault.
But of course, now that we know, not doing something about it will be our fault, right? That's where, you know, there really there, there is you know, blame uh, to be assigned. Okay, so heading towards the end here. So this perspective tells us that A, astrobiologies uh, uh, are probably are not rare. This is something that happens in the universe. And that really, this is the important point for me, triggering um, the Anthropocene marks a, tr a transition for both the planet and the civilization. Right? That's what's really interesting. That's why this moment, you know, every generation thinks that they live on the cusp of history. <laughs> Surprise, we are. Right? That we're literally at the moment where our activity is triggering a change in the whole planet. Um, and so what that really makes us are, as Carl Sagan said, we're cosmic teenagers. Right? If this has happened before, some civilizations may make it through and some don't. Right? And so we're like, we've just been given the keys to the, 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 the planet. Right? For those of you who've had kids, you know that moment when your kid starts to drive and that's when you really learn how to pray. Right? <laughs> and, you know, and hopefully your kid learns how to take this power they have over themselves and use it wisely. And that may take a while to learn. But, you know, eventually some do. Um, and that's what we are right now. And as a uh, uh, great climate scientist, Pierre Humbert, Pierre Humbert says, um, climate change is our final exam. I love that. So really, on some level, and this is an interesting thing, you know, climate change is not a story of villains and heroes, right? As much as we want to do that, right? But it's actually when we think about conflict um, and compassion, to understand that from the biosphere's perspective, you know, Donald Trump's not a villain. You know, Donald Trump is just, Donald Trump may be the folly that leads to our civilization, you know, falling in the long term, but he's not necessarily a villain. He's a player in this drama. Um, so what it could be, climate change could be, on a global civilization scale, is that it could be a story of right action and skillful means, because that's kind of what we have to figure out. Um, and this brings us back to the science and the sacred. We sustain what we value, right? And we value what we hold sacred. And that's where, you know, the idea is that somehow we have to become into some kind of cooperative relationship, as some as unimagined yet, cooperative relationship with the biosphere. And that's why this is, you know, where all boats rise. It's not going to be, you know, we're not just stewards of the biosphere. It's that, you know, somehow we understand that, like, you know, we have to allow the biosphere to become more productive, you know, as we become more productive. Um, and so, but that also requires sort of deep ecological values, the return of deep ecology, and the identif our identification with all life. Um, and that even though we may have to make choices, listen, the polar bears may not come through the Anthropocene with us. That may be a decision that we have to make, you know, um, and, and, you know, that's a, that's a hard kind of adult-like decision. But we need, as much, we need as much thriving and well-being as possible. And we're going to have to have skillful means to figure out what that actually looks like. So, um, yeah, I think that that identification with life, that putting ourselves back in the biosphere, is the key uh, to making, to resacralizing our relationship with nature. And it's part of, going back to the original thing that I said, of making science, bringing, bringing it back into sacredness. So I'll stop there, and I thank you very much.